Well, good morning, good morning. As you stand to your feet, it's good to be here. As we worship, as we sing, I think of Psalm 119. That I saw you, O oh Lord, my whole heart. Let me not forget your commandment. Your word I've hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. We sing to the King of kings and Lord of lords. So let us worship and lift up his name. Come on. We're reaching out to welcome you, God. Feel this place. a great a glimpse of a never-changing God. Till all we want and all we need is found in you, found in you, Jesus, everything so is found in you, found in Everything is because of him. And that same Psalm 119 says, teach me your way, your statutes. Continually through that Psalm, we see how we grow in him. We're blessed by his word, the truth that is in it. We know from John 14, 6, that he is the way and the truth and the life. We worship in that name, Jesus. So we sing, we proclaim it. Let us continue in that, come on. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, and I believe that you are my fortress, and you are my portion, and you are my hiding place. Oh, I believe you 
We believe in that name. We thank you, Lord. Oh, we believe in that name, the Son, the Father, and Holy Spirit. We worship Him. May we declare it in our belief who our God is, that He is great and greatly to be praised. Amen. Come on, let us sing to Him. I believe in the sun, I believe in the risen one, and I believe I overcome by the power of his blood. Amen.
was covered in sin and shame. I heard mercy call my name. We believe in that. We declare that truth. Come on. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to because they can't stay long when I believe in you are the way. The truth, the life, and I believe you are the way, oh, the truth, the life, and I believe you are. Amen. We believe in that. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank him, thank him this morning, amen. Amen. Powerful song and a powerful message, I believe. Amen. Well, would you be seated? We have a few announcements for you this morning. Good morning and welcome to Ocean State Baptist Church. We are so excited to have you here with us today. My name is Amanda, and here are a few announcements and some events coming up. If you are a first time guest, we wanna thank you so much for joining us. We would like to ask that you take this time to fill out a connection card. If you did not receive one when you first came in, you can find one located in the back of the seat directly in front of you. Our next Ironman meeting is coming up November 6th, Tuesday night at 7 p.m. All men are invited and we would love to encourage you to join us as Pastor Emerson teaches on Back to the Future. Last week, we introduced you to some new technology that is going to help us stay connected with you and you connected with us. If you are an attendee of the church or a member, we encourage you to go to osbc.infellowship.com to create your own personal accounts. We are encouraging everyone to do this because this is going to be replacing our current church directory. If you have any questions, please call the church and talk to Missy Lindsay. Thanks. We want to thank you so much for joining us today. If you are a first time guest, we hope that you felt right at home. Hope you enjoy the rest of the service and we look forward to seeing you again soon.
to be here and set up about 5 o'clock is when we need you here on Wednesday night to get that all ready. Looking forward to that. It's a great opportunity for us to invite the community to come onto our church property where we can be the salt and light of the world as Jesus commanded us to. So if you have kids, we'd love to have you come out. If you're volunteering, please do your best to be here so that we can uh, get everything set up, make sure everything's in the right places and get everything going. Would you bow your heads and pray with me this morning as we open our service? Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your word. As we sang about this morning, how it, it, the reason that we can do anything is because you live. We thank you for dying on the cross and paying for the penalty for our sins for us so that we can come into a relationship with you and we can spend eternity with you in one day. Lord, I do pray that you would be with the many in our church right now who are hurting, who are ill and going through difficulties, that you would bring comfort and strength as only you can and bring that peace that passes all understanding. Pray that you'd be with Pastor Mike as he's away this weekend. Give him safety. Give him a good time of relaxation and, and recharging of his batteries. We pray that you would just be with him, especially today. We do pray for the service this morning, Lord, that you would open our hearts, that you would open our ears so that we can hear what you have for us and we can apply it to our lives. As we go our separate ways, Lord, we can put it into practice and we can be what you've called us to be as Christians. We love you, Father. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, choir. Love to watch out and see you guys singing with them. That's great. I love it. John, you scared me the first time when this morning in the early service when you stomped your foot. I thought something was going on. <laughs> he woke me up. If you would take your Bibles, we're in Matthew chapter 5 this morning. If you're looking with the hymn by, or the uh, Bible in the pew uh, right in front of you there, that's page 1115. Page 1115. It's Matthew chapter 5. One of my favorite sections of the Bible. I love this passage, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. When I was young, we had to memorize the entire section, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's one of the most famous passages in the Bible. It's one of Jesus' uh, messages that he's preached with us called the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus gives us this section, and at the very beginning, to start it all off, he gives us this part called the Beatitudes or the Blesseds, and he tells us how we can have a blessed life. So what we're talking about this morning rolls, goes right along with that. And if I was to come around and ask each one of you this morning, go in, in between each one of the rows and talk to each one of you individually, and ask you if you wanted to live a blessed life, odds are everybody would say yes. Because nobody wants the opposite of the blessed life, which is a cursed life. No one says when they're young, I want to grow up and be broke and to quote the famous theologian Chris Farley, live in a van down by the river. The first service had no idea who that was. But nobody says that. They, nobody admits that they want that. But the truth of the matter is we get to choose what kind of a life we want to have, whether it's blessed and we live under God's blessings or if, it's, if, if we don't. It's our choice. We can look around at people and as we go through our daily lives, whether it be at work or whether it be in the market, or whether it's wherever it is in your community. And we can look at people, and most of the time, that we'll see a lot of people that when we look at them, the first word that does not come to mind is blessed. Because there's a lot of people who are not living a blessed life. We'd probably say more of a lot of people that we see that they're struggling, or that they're not really all that they could be, or they're not reaching their potential, or maybe that they're living paycheck to paycheck, or maybe that they're having trouble in their, with their kids or in their marriage. Some people dress it up and make it look good on the outside. They wear nice clothes, and they live in a nice home, and they drive the nicest cars, and they have the nicest things. But, and they, on the outside, it looks like they're living a blessed life. But the truth of the matter is we can't see inside of their heart we can't see inside of their lives and know they're barely making their finance payments or the fact that their spouse and them have been arguing and fighting and are close to divorce or they're having trouble with their kids. So it's very easy to put up a false facade and look like we're living a blessed life without actually living a real blessed life. Today as we look at Matthew chapter 5, we're going to see this blessed life and what it's all about. And Pastor Mike preached through this section not long ago in a series called on the Hill with the Master. And it was a great series, and it's available on the church app and on the website. Yes, that's a shameless plug. Download the app if you haven't done it. And you can follow along with a lot of things there. There's fill-in-the-blank notes, Bible study, devotionals, all the messages, all kinds of good stuff on there. So download that and watch that series that he did. But this section is known as the Sermon on the Mount, and it begins with these Beatitudes, or the Blesseds. And Jesus gives us eight characteristics of those who are blessed. So let's look at chapter 5, verse number 3, where it starts off, and it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meek. Now that does not mean weak. I've talked to people who say, well, I can't live a meek life. That's weak life. And that's not true. Meekness is simply power under control. So it's saying to live a controlled life. Verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart. You know, there's not a lot of people who are living pure lives today or a life that's characterized by purity. He goes on. Blessed are the peacemakers, verse 9, for they shall be called the sons of God. Peacemakers. Doesn't seem like there's a lot of peacemakers in our world today, does it? Seems like there's a lot more peacetakers than peacemakers. Have you ever met a peacetaker? When they're around, it just feels like conflict follows them. Our world is characterized by this. Even if you watch the news this week with that shooting that just happened in, um, where was it, in Pittsburgh at the synagogue where 11 people were killed. Peacemakers. Verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. 
For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Jesus says if you're going to live this life, there are going to be people who are going to persecute, make fun of, put down uh, you because of your faith. Now there's a lot of amazing principles in this section and we could spend weeks going into each one of these verses and digging down into there. But the verse I want us to zero in on this morning is verse number 6. It says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. Can I ask you a question this morning? Do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? Do you really hunger and thirst after righteousness? Most of us probably uh, today, we've Our lives are really, if we're honest, are filled with a lot of things that just really don't matter. I mean, that football game that we just had to get home and watch last week. Do you even remember who won? How about the Super Bowl last year? Who won the Super Bowl? That's a touchy subject in New England right now. Who who won the Super Bowl last year? The Eagles did. That's right. What about the year before? The Patriots did win. That was okay. What about the year before that? Who? The Broncos did. Oh, yeah, the Broncos. Yep, that's it. Forgot already. That's just been a few years ago. Or that TV show that you just have to get home to watch. The number one TV show last year was a TV show called The Big Bang Theory. The year before that was NCIS, and then in 15 it was The Big Bang Theory, and then for three years in a row it was NCIS. And then from 2006 to 2011 it was American Idol. And so many people had to rush home on Wednesday night to watch American Idol. Can I ask you, do you remember anybody who won? You might be able to name one or two if you watched the show, but can you give me a list of every person who won every year? Those things that were so important that we had to rush home and we had to watch or we had to do, they just, they don't last. Today at 1 o'clock, I'm going to be at home if, if I can. I grew up in Cincinnati. And the Bengals are playing the Buccaneers at 1 o'clock. And it's probably going to be a game I'm going to want to forget soon. (laughs) I like to watch the Bengals, and I I guess that makes me a glutton for punishment. But at the end of the season, odds are I'll look back at this game and probably not remember anything that happens unless there's some great play or somebody gets injured, God forbid, or something like that. But we can go through an entire season of football and at the end of the season look back and really most of the time we don't remember a whole lot of what happened during that season. Once it's over, we move on and we forget about it. And people today are searching and looking for fulfillment and things that are just superfluous or empty that that mean nothing. Why? Because we fill our lives with things that just don't matter. So what should we be filling our life with? Well, according to this passage, we should be filling our life with righteousness, right living, right things. So in your life, in your home, in your marriage, what do you hunger for? That word hunger there means to pursue what matters most. What in your life, what in your home, what in your marriage are you pursuing that matters more than anything else to you? Would you be seeking after and pursuing something that means something or just something that is empty, that holds nothing? Probably since we're here at church, most of us would want to give a spiritual answer because we're at church. You know, so we're going to say things like, well, I'm pursuing after God or to please God. But what if I asked your kids? Kids are honest. And they like to tell on us. And I have to be careful what I say when I realize, especially my little Alyssa, who's eight years old, is sitting behind me in the Jeep. And someone cuts me off. Because she's a little parrot. And when she gets home, mommy finds out what daddy did. Or... <laughs> But our kids will be honest with us. Would they say that what we're seeking after is good? Would they say what's... Well, let's just take the last seven days. Let's just take this last week. What were you seeking after or pursuing that mattered most to you just this past week? What were you hungering for or pursuing? Was it just relaxation? Well, I guess there's nothing wrong with relaxation. Or having a good time or working hard all week so you can relax on the weekend like the old song, everybody's working for the weekend or or some kind of sports or popularity or an image management so that when people look at me, they see what I want them to see, not necessarily what is true. 
What's the thing that I went after? Was it just the win, the more money, or the bigger house, or the nicer boat, or the better car, or, or was I was just going for the win? What is it that the last seven days I hungered and thirsted for? You know, if we're really honest, a lot of times we'd have to say that we pursue one thing, or sometimes many things, above God. We're not hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Hungering and thirsting, though, has to do with our appetites. What are you hungry for? What drives you? What do we do when we realize, though, that we're hungering and thirsting for things other than righteousness? I have to change my appetite. I have to change what it is that I want to go after because what you feed yourself will change your appetite. As a young man, I didn't like to read very much. As most young men don't, I would wait. You know, instead of reading the book, I'd wait for the movie to come out or something like that. So I didn't like to read, but I heard a, a man say one time, and it, it really impacted me. He said, all leaders are readers, and if you aren't a reader, you'll never be a leader. And I thought, you know what? I need to start reading. I need to invest in learning and growing personally. So I began to read. Every night I would read before I went to bed, and I started carrying my phone or my iPad, read on there, or read several books. And right now I'm in the middle of about four or five. I, I love to read now. Why? Because I started doing it. I started... Uh, changing my appetites. How did that happen? I just had to start doing it. And the more I did it, the more I liked it. And the more I liked it, the more I wanted to do it. And if we start pursuing God and walking with him, we're going to start seeing the benefits and the blessings of it. We have to start doing it. And when we start to do it, we'll want it more. And then the more we want of it, the more we want of him. And the more we want of him, the more we're going to dig into his word. And we're going to start spending more time in prayer. So the more that I dig down, the more I, my appetite will change. And all of a sudden, my appetite's changed and I begin to crave him. And we want him more than the things of this world that would just distract us before because those things just don't satisfy. And now we begin to be satisfied and fulfilled in life because our appetites have changed. I'm hungering. I'm thirsting after righteousness. But why don't we see this more in our own lives and in other Christians today? It seems like a lot of people try and, and you know, every New Year's, we've got to try something new. I'm going to do better this year. Starting January 1st, I'm going to read my Bible every day, or I'm going to pray every day, or I'm going to go to the gym every day. You know that, how long that lasts? Gym memberships go up in January. About six weeks later, the gyms are empty again. Because we just, let's just be honest, we just don't want to do it. Sitting in the couch or laying in bed is just so much more fun than going and torturing yourself. Our appetites don't change. But there are things that will help us and things that will hurt us when we try to change this appetite of hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And before we talk about what does work, what doesn't work in our lives? Well, the first thing that won't work if I'm going to change my appetites is legalistic Christianity. There's a lot of that today. This is where we reduce Christianity to a list of rules. This is the, you know, where I grew up in Kentucky, there was an old saying. And yeah, there's a lot of old sayings in Kentucky. Most of them we can't say in church. But this one said, we don't drink, cuss, smoke, or chew, or run around with those that do. And that was kind of the thing. We just, we were very, had a list. And Christianity became a list of do's and don'ts. I can do this, I can't do that. I can go here, I can't go there. I can wear this, I can't wear that. And it became just following a list. And we think that this list makes us a good Christian. But there's a problem with that. Rules without a relationship lead to rebellion. See, the Christian life is not a list. The Christian life is a relationship. It's not about follow these rules. It's about follow after Him. I want Christ in my life. I want to please him. So that, does that change the things that I do? Well, obviously it does. But my motives have changed. It's not to fill out a list. It's to get to know him better so that I can please him, so that I may know him, as Paul said. But it's not just a list. Lists don't work. Don't believe me? You ever tried one of the new fad diets that come out? If you eat only what's on this list, you will lose this amount of weight. And if you, do, if you cheat at any point, then you're going to have to start all over and all of this stuff. And the average diet lasts less than a week because you know what the first three letters of diet are? D-I-E. And everybody wants to die because we don't like it. 
And that's what Jesus is trying to teach us here in Matthew, that it's not about a list. It's about the relationship. I have to hunger and thirst after righteousness. I have to hunger and thirst after him. So legalistic Christianity following a list will never work because it's not about him. But not only will legalistic Christianity not work, lukewarm Christianity will not work. This is where we say we believe in God, but we live as if we do not. God is just something we do on Sundays, but the rest of the week, we live however we want. Revelation chapter 3, the Bible tells us that he wishes we were either cold or hot, but we are neither. And because of that, we're lukewarm. He'll spit us out of his mouth. So Christ says, I, I would rather you be hot or cold, but this lukewarm thing just doesn't work. This is cultural Christianity. This is Christianity in name only. There's no passion in that. There's no passion for the things of God there. There's no hungering. There's no thirsting after him. Do you know how you know if you're lukewarm or not? When's the last time that you went to God without your list of prayer requests? God, would you please do this and then this and we'll check this one off and please help this person and please help that person. It just becomes a list where God is our genie in the bottle where we rub our little Christian lamp and we ask him to fulfill our three wishes. Or we come to him like Santa Claus at Christmas. Would you please give me everything on my list, God? When is the last time that you just spent some time talking to him? Do we really hunger and thirst? Or is it just something that we do on the weekend? When's the last time we talked with, about him to our friends or family members? Or when's the last time we as a family served together or got involved in doing something for someone else? You see, it's not just a Wednesday and Sunday religion or a Sunday only or Christmas and Easter only thing. It's not just being lukewarm. Jesus says, hot or cold, but lukewarm, I'll spit out. Legalistic Christianity and lukewarm Christianity, they're just never going to get the job done. So what is going to work? Here it is, real simple. Don't live the Christian life. Did he just say that in church? Don't live the Christian life. Live a Christ-centered life. There is a world of difference between Christian life and Christ-centered life life. You see, it's not about being a Christian. Because being a Christian can mean anything you want it to be. How do we know? Well, there's Christians on every side of politics. Some say that if you don't vote Democrat, you're not a Christian. Some say if you don't vote Republican or Independent, you can't be a Christian. Some Christians are pro-life, some are pro-choice. Some are a part of every political campaign that you've ever seen. There's Christians on both sides of every social issue. There's Christians on both sides of every war. How can someone who is fighting for this country in a foxhole who believes in God, who is a Christian, pray and ask God to bless him because he's right and help them win the war when somebody is on the other side of the line praying the exact same thing to the exact same God? Because Christianity can mean whatever we want it to mean because in today's world it means nothing. You can be anything and say you're a Christian. Christianity is such a vague term. So don't try to live a Christian life. Live a Christ-centered life. You, you, know, you can walk around and call yourself a duck. You can quack like a duck. And if you don't lay eggs, you're not a duck. You're just a weirdo walking around quacking. We can call ourselves whatever we want. What I'm saying is that Jesus isn't just a part of our lives. He is at the center of our lives. Psalm 63, 1 says, Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you. Have you ever prayed like that? Have you ever felt like that? Oh God, I just want to earnestly search for you. I want you more than anything. My soul is so thirsty. I just want a little bit more of you. My whole body just longs for you, God. Have you ever felt like that before? Have you ever prayed like that before? See, that's not Christianity. That's a Christ-centered life. That's a life that is just all about God, not about the things that I want or the things that make me happy. But there's so many people who live like, oh God, my bed, sleeping in, I love you. And their God becomes sleeping in. Or Little League Baseball team, you're my God. Or, or car, or boat, or money, or job, or whatever it is, fill in the blank. Even a relationship, you are my God. Because that's what they're focused on. And that's just plain stupid. But that's how a lot of people live. And then they wonder why their lives are so empty. Because things never satisfy. 
Bill Gates was asked one time what would make him happy. You know his response? Another million. Always wanting a little bit more. The Bible says it. The eyes of man are never satisfied. We always want more. Everybody wants a little bit more, a little bit better. So how can I get to the point and help my family get to the point of hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Well, I'm going to have to change my appetites. So how do I create this hunger and thirst after God? Well, if I'm going to have a hunger and thirst after God, I've got to involve God in my daily conversations. Look at all the blessings that he's given to us. Have you walked outside and looked around at creation? I mean, fall in New England is gorgeous. All the leaves changing color, and, and you walk outside, and it looks like an artist can't recreate that. But people believe that it just happened by chance. Well, that's just stupid. God did that. And I've been to some places in the world that I don't think are quite as beautiful. I mean, when we lived in the South, they had this season. It was called leaf season. And supposedly, people would drive from all around to see the leaves down South. They were all just brown. <laughs> I'm driving around thinking, why in the world would anybody drive for any distance to look at this? But here, I mean, we're blessed. God, it's beautiful outside. You can't walk outside and not see the blessings of God and how beautiful his creation is. So it's very easy to bring him into our different conversations as we talk to people. Pastor Mike just talked about it two weeks ago. We should talk about him at home and talk about him while we're traveling and at bedtime and at morning. You remember the message talking about our families. Pastor Mike just, just went through all of that. Some people may not listen when we talk about him and when we bring him into other, those conversations, but that's okay. Some people will, and you never know who God's bringing across your path who needs to hear that from you today. When I start talking about him more and more, I'm going to automatically be thinking about him more and more. And the more I think about him, the more I'm going to want him, the more I'm going to desire him. And before you know it, my appetites begin to change because I'm involving him in the conversations of my everyday life. If I want to hunger and thirst after him, I'm also going to have to make church a non-negotiable. I know that sounds tough, but if we're going to have a Christ-centered life or a Christ-centered home, we got to make worshiping God a non-negotiable. I mean, think about it. Sunday groups are an hour. Sunday morning service like this, it's an hour. A Wednesday night, if you come back for life groups or word walk or whatever we're doing at that time, it's an hour. So you're looking at a maximum of three hours out of 168 hours. That's not that much. So we've got to make it a priority, make church a part of our family culture. It will help us to create a hunger. It'll help us to create a thirst after him. Because our, not only will it help us, but it's going to help our families as well. I want my kids to see that God is a priority in my life because I want my kids in church when they grow up. And what we do in moderation, our children will do in excess. So we need to make sure God is a priority in our lives. Then I need to understand that seeking and serving God is fun. You know, seeking and serving, seeking God's fun. Reading God's word can be fun. You know, I love to read God's word, especially the stories. I, I, I have this weird imagination where when I'm reading the Bible, I like put myself into the story. And, and there, there's some awesome stories in the Bible. There's some crazy stories in the Bible. I mean, if you saw some of the things that happened in the stories in the Bible, if you were there, it would change the way you think about everything. It'd change your life. You'd, you'd want to know more. So you just got to, now I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, all of the, 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 the leprous boils in Leviticus. I don't get excited about reading about that or the lists of genealogies and the names that nobody can pronounce. Uh, those things, okay. But you know what, when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John talking about Jesus' life and what he did, his ministry and the miracles that he did and all of these things, man, if you put yourself in that story, it's exciting. So reading God's word can be fun. Serving God can be fun. You know, if, even if you, don't, if you don't do it all the time, putting other people first, when you start doing it and serving God by serving others, that can be enjoyable because you get your mind off yourself. And all of a sudden, we're thinking about other people. There's all kinds of ways we can do that. I mean, we got over 100 people just involved in the cleaning ministry here. I mean, that's awesome. doesn't get done without people. We've got to serve the Lord. But we need to get in God's word. We need to serve. I mean, even finding a good book that can help you in your spiritual life. There are tons of good books out there that you can find and read to help develop a hunger and thirst after him. Our kids need to develop that as well. 
we have a little app that we have on our different devices that the kids like, especially my young, I can't say my youngest anymore. Alyssa, she's eight. Our youngest one's three, three, three months, three months, four months. I don't know. He's, he's somewhere. Uh, it's just like a blur when you don't sleep. I sleep, she doesn't, but no. But Allie's got this little app that she does after she goes to bed. After her bedtime, she lays down, she opens it up, she's doing her devotion. It's got little Bible stories and little things in there that they can do and earn different points and stuff. And, and we use it kind of like a, a little extra reward. You can stay up late and have your devotions. What kid doesn't want to stay up late? I mean, stay up late and have devotions? Okay, well, yeah, that's better than, okay, kids, come around here. We're all going to sit down now and instead of playtime, you got to put all your toys away, put your Xbox, turn it all off. We're going to sit down and we're going to read the Bible. Some kids, they're going to not like that because they want to play. And we're taking something away from them. We should never use the Bible as a punishment. It ought to be an enjoyable thing. So we've got to get creative in how we get our kids into the Word. If that means staying up a few minutes late, then, hey, let's stay up a few minutes late and learn more about the Bible. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Yeah. We ought to get our kids excited about it. And our children and our teenagers have to develop a hunger and a thirst after God. Here's the reason. We won't have to tell them to be good if they're pursuing the one who is good. So we got to get them pursuing and headed the right direction so that they will behave. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he'll give you everything that you need. If we seek after him, our verse that we're at in Matthew 5 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness... For they shall be what? Filled. Do you want fulfillment in your life? Do you want fulfillment in your family's life? Then seek after the only thing that can give you fulfillment. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Pursue righteousness. So let me ask you again this morning. Are you hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Joshua chapter 24 says, Choose today whom you will serve. Then he goes on a little bit later in that same verse and says, but as for me and my house, we will serve who? See, we've got to choose each day. It's not a one and done thing where we make a decision once and that's it. We're just going to do it from now on because we can get distracted. But I want to have a Christ-centered home and I want to be a Christ-centered person. So let's develop a hunger and thirst for righteousness in our lives and in our homes. Let me ask you again. Do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? Do you really hunger and thirst after righteousness? Hunger. I like food. That's pretty obvious if you look at me. I like to eat. And when you get hungry, what happens? You can talk to me. It's okay. You start to feel the pain. What do you start doing? Searching for food. If you're like me, my Jeep like has this automatic thing where when I'm hungry, it finds drive throughs We start looking for something to eat, something that will satisfy us. What happens when you get thirsty? Man, and when it's hot outside, there is nothing like a cold glass of water, is there? We look for it. Something to satisfy, something that will fill us, something that will take care of that. When I was young, I used to mow a lot of grass. And we had seven acres that I had to mow, and we had this walk-behind mower. So, I mean, it was a lot of walking, and it was hot. And I'll never forget one day I was out mowing the grass, and I was so thirsty. And I went over to the truck, and, and I used to mix my gas and oil mixture, this two-cycle mix, in a two-liter bottle of Dr. Pepper. I was thirsty. It had been a long day. And I ran over and I saw that two liter and for some reason it was in the front and not back with the mower and stuff like that. So I grabbed it. It's almost the same color. It looks similar. It doesn't taste anything like Dr. Pepper. <laughs> I grabbed that thing and started drinking it and it burned. Not just once. It was rough. It didn't satisfy I had to drink a bunch of milk, and my mom called poison control, and it was, it was a crazy day that I will never forget. Never made that mistake again. Got a little gas can. I just mix it in that, Brandon. <laughs> it didn't satisfy me. 
There's a lot of things in life that we can look for satisfaction in that is not going to bring satisfaction and can really hurt us badly. And it may look like something that's good. But if it's not the real thing, it's just going to leave us searching. Are you hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Is it the thing that drives you more than anything else when you're really, really hungry that you, you just can't find food? You've got to eat and you're, you're starving as we say to death. Is that the way you feel about reading your Bible or spending time talking with God in prayer? The way you pursue finding a drink after you've been out in the heat all day and you just are parched. You've got to have something to drink because you're about to die. Is that the way we pursue God in our life? Or is he just a weekend event? Are we really hungering and thirsting after God? See, not only will, does this affect me, but if I'm not hungering and thirsting after God, it's going to affect my family. And if I'm not hungering and thirsting after God, how can I expect God to do something in my life, my family's life, or my community if he's not the priority in my life? Are you hungering and thirsting after God this morning? Let's pray together. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for all that you've done for us and your blessings on our life. And you have been far, far too good to us. Help us to hunger after you, to seek after you, to thirst after you, to really pursue you like it's life or death because it is. You may be here this morning and as we've gone through this, you've thought, I don't hunger and thirst after God. Maybe you're a Christian and you feel that way. Well, you can. We've just got to change our appetites. You may be here and say, you know what? I don't hunger and thirst after God, but I, I've never come into a relationship with Jesus. We can help you with that. You can become child of God. You can make sure heaven is your home. You can know for sure that if you died today, you can know for sure you can go to heaven. It's very simple. The Bible lays it out very simply. I just have to understand that I'm a sinner. I have broken God's standard of righteousness. I have I've sinned. And because I have sinned, there's a penalty for it. Just like if I get in my car and drive down the interstate really fast, I'm probably going to get pulled over for breaking the law. And when I break God's law, there's consequences for that. It's separation from God in a terrible place called hell. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And that death is a separation from God in hell. And if that's where the Bible stopped, every single one of us would have to go to hell because we've all broken God's law. We've all sinned. But it doesn't go stop there. It goes on and says, but whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can be saved. He says that it's the gift of God. It's a gift. And all we have to do for a gift is just receive it, just like any Christmas present or birthday present. I don't have to live a good life. I don't have to pay for it. But it's a gift to me that I can receive. That's the way salvation is. And Christ is offering you that free gift of eternal life if you'll just accept it. And the way we do that, again, the Bible says, for whosoever, that's anybody, shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. It's coming to him, admitting you're a sinner, understanding the penalty Knowing what Christ did to pay for that penalty, he died on a cross, shed his blood to pay for my sin. He died so I wouldn't have to. And receiving that free gift of salvation. If you're here this morning and you've never done that, you can do that this morning and know for sure that you are a child of God. You don't have to come up here forward or, or make a big speech or really do anything except for just simply call on him. And you can do that right where you're seated in your own heart, not even out loud because God knows our heart and he hears our prayers. So right where you're seated, if you've never called on his name and never become a Christian and you'd like to do that this morning, I'll even help you with what to say, but it's not the words that save you. It's not hocus pocus, alakazam, say these words, you get to go to heaven. It's not an incantation. It's a gift. And God's looking at our heart. And if you're ready to receive that gift this morning, you can do it now. So right where you're seated, again, not out loud, just in your heart, would you just pray with me? Again, you have to mean it. And God sees your heart. So would you just pray with me? Dear God, go ahead, right where you're seated in your own heart. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell because of my sins. But thank you for dying on the cross. 
and paying the penalty for my sin. The best I know how, I receive your free gift of eternal life. I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If you prayed that prayer with me, I would never point you out. I would never embarrass you in any way. But after the service is over, I'm going to be over in the Welcome Center, which is just out the doors to your left. I'll be standing out there. If you're a guest, I'd love to meet you. We have a gift for you. But if you prayed that prayer, would you just come up and shake my hand and say, hey, bro, I prayed with you. You know what? I'm going to be excited. I won't embarrass you. I won't point you out. I just want to know so I can pray for you too. Would you just come out and shake my hand and say, dude, I prayed with you. Christian, are you hungering and thirsting after him? Is he the main passion, drive, and goal in your life? Truth of the matter is we all have room for improvement in here. As we stand and Steve's playing, if God spoke to you, you can go ahead and stand right now if you would with me, please. If you need to do business with God, we have this altar here. You can come and pray, and there's workers that can help you if you need somebody to pray with you. But right now, would you just go ahead, if God spoke to you, and make that decision that you're going to change your appetites, that you're going to go, you're going to do whatever it is that he's told you to do. Are you hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Is he the passion of your life? 